As I stood on that vast sheet of ice floating in the unforgiving North Atlantic Ocean, the biting cold winds whipped through my clothing and the snowstorm enveloped everything in an eerie white haze. Our ship, the SS Newfoundland, our only salvation, was invisible in the blizzard that surrounded us. Every passing minute brought us closer to the frozen night, during which some of my comrades wouldn't wake up in the morning. This is the haunting tale of the 1914 sealing disaster, a story etched in the icy depths of the North Atlantic. The commercial sealing industry thrived in the early 20th century, particularly for the island of Newfoundland, nestled on the east coast of Canada. St. John's, the capital city strategically positioned, served as the gateway for sealing ships venturing into the North Atlantic, abundant with seals. Seal hunting controversial today, literally built communities like St. John's over a century ago, with a significant portion of the population relying on it for their livelihood. The life of an average seal hunter was a grueling and gruesome ordeal. The messy, physically demanding work lacked safety regulations, with crews enduring up to 12 hours straight on ice floes where seals predominantly roamed. Dropping hunters on the ice miles away from their ship was standard practice, ensuring seals weren't spooked. After a successful hunt, the arduous trek back to the ship awaited. All this unfolded before considering the unpredictable North Atlantic weather, especially during seasonal transitions. During April, the ice flows, growing up to six miles wide, began to melt and become fragile, making it easier for ships to navigate. However, for vessels lacking strong ice-breaking capabilities, like the SS Newfoundland, getting stuck in the ice for days was a genuine risk. This is precisely what transpired in the waning days of March 1914. The Newland, initially built as a cargo ship in 1872, was repurposed as a sealing ship, lacking the essential ice-breaking hull. Compared to purpose-built ships, it was at a serious disadvantage, measuring just 212 feet in length with a narrow beam of 29 feet. On that fateful day, March 30, 1914, the Newland came to a grinding halt while navigating through an ice floe. Wester Keane, the 27-year-old son of Abram Keane and captain of the ship, faced a critical decision, and by the industry's unwritten rules against helping each other, he and his father devised a discreet signaling system to communicate about spotted seal herds. The dilemma arose when the Stefano, their partnership, was located five to seven miles. Sending the crew on foot became a precarious choice, considering the distance and the treacherous ice conditions. The crew set out, buoyed by overcast but relatively calm weather. However, the warm spring weather had weakened the ice, turning every step into a cautious endeavor. The crew encountered weak spots, forcing them to tread carefully. The Stefano, initially visible, seemed to elude them as they closed in, prompting some to abandon the mission. As conditions worsened, the Stefano came to a sudden stop, and Abram ordered the crew to finish their food and return to the ice for the hunger. A series of mistakes unfolded. Abram's first officer had miscalculated the distance between the ships, influencing the decision-making process. Abram, relying on his experience, assured George, the captain of the Newland, that the walk would take no more than two hours. Unbeknownst to the crew, the incorrect calculations would set a catastrophic chain of events in motion. The crew, ill-prepared for the worsening weather, ventured forward. Seal hunters, notorious for underdressing and traveling light, faced the elements without coats or hats. As temperatures plummeted, exhaustion, cold, and wet conditions overwhelmed the crew. The walk initially planned to be closer to the Newland took an unexpected turn when George realized they were a mile and a half from the Stefano, not the Newland. Frustration set in as they found themselves three and a half miles away from their intended destination. Caught in a dilemma, George had to decide whether to press on in the dark, risking men falling through the ice into the freezing waters, or stay on the ice, knowing some wouldn't wake up in the morning. So the crew, facing exhaustion, freezing rain and snow, struggled onward, only to be met with a devastating realization at daybreak. Almost half the crew had frozen to death overnight. In a grim procession, the remaining crew gathered the lifeless bodies, stacking them together for retrieval later. The march continued, the freezing rain turned to snow and George and Thomas had to rely on the Bellaventure, a sealing ship, for rest. 
The relief was palpable as the ship steamed toward them, loading seals onto the deck. However, the ship, obscured by the smoke from its stacks blown by the wind, sailed away, leaving the stranded crew in despair. As George's group of nine faced the bitter reality of abandonment, he made a crucial decision. Unable to go further, he led a smaller, fitter group toward the Newland, hoping to return and rescue the others. The desperate wait for rescue ensued, but the Newland remained stuck, and attempts to break free proved futile. Then, in the middle of the night, a sharp cracking sound echoed through the icy silence. The crew, whether on the ship or waiting on the ice, screamed as the Newland broke free. The relief was short-lived as the Bella Venture, upon realizing the mistake, steamed away once again. The crew's hopes dimmed, their situation more dire than ever. Morning brought a new plan. George's group of nine splintered into three, with one group unable to proceed, George and two others heading toward the Newland, and a final group of two heading toward the Bella Venture. As they pressed on, Abram, aboard the Newland, received information from George about the surviving groups. The ship's poor ice navigation capabilities left them helpless, but the Stefano and another sealing ship, the SS Floor, joined the rescue efforts. As survivors were brought to safety, the harsh reality sank in. Only 55 of the 132 men who set out on March 31st survived, with one more passing away in the hospital days later. The inquiry that followed revealed damning inconsistencies in leadership accounts. While criminal charges were avoided due to the lack of a singular cause, blame was distributed for the errors in decision-making and communication. The disaster cast a long shadow over the lives of those involved in the sealing industry itself. The haunting memories of that icy ordeal remained etched in the collective consciousness, a stark reminder of the unforgiving nature of the North Atlantic and the consequences of human error in the face of its challenges. In the aftermath of the 1914 sealing disaster, as survivors and the families of the deceased grappled with the emotional fallout, a comprehensive inquiry sought to shed light on the events that transpired during those harrowing days in the North Atlantic. Months of interviews culminated in a damning report that, while sparing individuals from criminal charges, cast a discerning eye on the leaders. George Wester, Wester Keene, and Abram Keene, each leader faced scrutiny for their role in the catastrophe. Wester Keene maintained that he instructed George to seek shelter with the Stefano for the night, but George opted to return to the Newland after completing their work. Meanwhile, Abram Keene faced severe criticism for his inaccurate calculations that determined the drop-off point for the men on the ice. The experienced captain's flawed navigation set the disastrous course in motion. Despite the revelations and blame attributed in the report, criminal charges were avoided due to the absence of a singular cause. Abram Keene, despite the tarnishing of his reputation, continued his career in sealing for another two decades, gradually regaining respect within the industry. The disaster left an indelible mark on all those involved, altering the trajectory of their lives and contributing to the industry's changing dynamics.